my uh, energy pill. Just a second. I'm joking. Okay. okay. Uh, I authorized. Good. So uh, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce Eitan Sayag, who many of you know, from Ben Gurion. Uh, from uh, Ben Gurion University, and announce his talk on the most continuous part of the Plancherel decomposition of a real spherical space. Hi. Thank you very much, Dima. Thank you for uh, having me. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, recent, uh, not quite recent, work that we are working uh, with uh, Job Koit, who is here. And um, in that work, we try to understand uh, a certain part in the Plancherel uh, formula for real spherical spaces. And this is uh, <clears throat> an ongoing project, and we hope to finish it uh, soon. We are just essentially reading and checking all kind of details but it seems okay so uh, let me let me without further ado uh, start so what what is it that we we want to achieve when we talk about natural decomposition so um, we first of all will will in our setup we will have a G a real reductive group and uh, H is going to be a, an algebraic subgroup, which is unimodular. Um, and in this case, we will have uh, a quotient space, G mod H, which is a, a G homogeneous space. At the moment, I'm not assuming anything about H, uh, apart from the unimodularity. Uh, this allows me to, to obtain a measure, an environment, G environment measure on Z. So we have the, a typical uh, function space representation, G is acting on L2 of Z uh, with respect to this measure. This is the left regular representation, which is unitary. And uh, basically the problem is to decompose this unitary representation into irreducible unitary representations of G. So as most all of us know, uh, the concept of decomposition is, is, is a tricky one, but at least intuitively, you know, we have the picture for what we call the group case. And, we, we, and in that case, we, we want to decompose uh, L2 on the line or L2 on, on a circle. And, and these, these, of course, behave very differently. Okay, so we have the abstract Pantrell formula. So I mean, just this, this is a huge jump, but still it's uh, the, the power of functional analysis. So we get uh, um, a certain space, uh, the unitary dual of G, which is basically the, collection of uh, isomorphism classes of unitary representations of G. And this space miraculously uh, have a, a measure, it's called the Plantrell measure. And L2 of Z is supposed to be decomposed into an integral. This integral might of course include also some summons, uh, of course, depending on the nature of this measure, D nu pi. Um, and in this uh, decomposition, uh, H pi is just a notation for the Hilbert space underlying the irreducible representation pi. And M pi is the multiplicity space describing the way that pi occurs, whatever that means in L2 of Z. So this uh, concept is of course very tricky, but that's what we are uh, uh, writing. So this is the abstract functional decomposition and our Goal is to make this more explicit. That's basically the problem. So, um, is my connection good enough so I can be heard? I hear you well. Okay, okay. Okay, so in general, we expect to have both discrete parts and continuous families which will contribute to the decomposition. And we know all kinds of examples, as I said, L2 of R, L2 of the circle, and uh, there are also some mixed cases, for example, for SL2R, uh, the decomposition have discrete series representations and um, of course, many continuous families, continuous families. So, okay, so the Planchorel decomposition uh, has a long history. And of course, I'm not going to uh, follow all of it just to give some general flavor. So uh, the group case, uh, namely, uh, the study of L2 of G and decomposing it into irreducible representations 
uh, unitary uh, was done, I assume, in the 60s and in the 70s by Hari Chandra. Uh, later on, uh, the same project was uh, pushed to decompose other spaces. And the, the next, uh, I think, big development is in the 80s and in the 90s, uh, when people studied uh, sub, the subgroup H is now a symmetric subgroup. So this just basically means that it's the fixator, the fixed point of an involution, a direct involution defined on G. And one can slightly uh, extend this concept. So these are called the reductive symmetric spaces. And uh, in that case, the project, this big project, which as you see, took uh, a lot of time and, and many important and interesting papers had basically two steps. Very <laughs> grosso modo. Uh, first, uh, there was a description or an attempt to, to describe the discrete series representation. So this is a huge uh, achievement already in the group case. This was uh, one of the uh, most important results of Harish Chandra to understand for what groups we do have a discrete series and how to parameterize them. Later on, other people suggested constructions in the group case. Um, in the symmetric case, things are still more complicated, but uh, uh, this work was done by, by these groups of people, um, Shima Matsuki and uh, Flintson Jensen. And, uh, and the second step is to uh, modulo the understanding of discrete series for all symmetric spaces, reductive symmetric spaces, to construct the actual plantural decomposition. And this, this was achieved by uh, two groups. Uh, the, the law uh, independently uh, found the and Schlitt work. Uh, later on, uh, much later, uh, people moved to study spherical spaces. I would say that this is probably motivated partly uh, because of uh, the theory of automorphic forms, but okay, I'm not, I cannot say for sure what was the motivation, but um, in the Piadi case, this was studied by uh, Sekeleris and Venkatesh and uh, Delorme, who also studied the Piadic symmetric spaces and achieved quite complete results there. And in the real uh, spherical spaces, this is a more recent uh, development. Um, and uh, many people, as you see, are involved. And <clears throat> quite recently, uh, there, there is a very, very rapid development in this, in, in this topic, and some of it I will, I will mention today. Okay, so what are these real spherical spaces? So we talk about them as generalization of symmetric spaces. So basically the formal definition I'm going to follow is that um, Z is a real spherical space if a minimal parabolic P in G admits an open orbit in Z. Um, so this is kind of a formal definition, but there are many, many examples. And uh, uh, as I said, any reductive symmetric space is an example of such, uh, satisfy this property. Uh, but on the other, you would think extreme is when you look at, G of course, in the symmetric case, the subgroup H is reductive. Uh, in, when you look at the at, uh, group uh, situations of the form G modulo a unipotent group, uh, these are called sometimes horospherical spaces. So um, these spaces are, in some sense, not occurring in this theory of symmetric spaces. Uh, there are other interesting examples. For example, the, the triple case, uh, which occurs a lot in uh, automorphic forms and the story of Gelfand pairs. Um, and there are some interesting examples of the form where you have SO2n plus one inside SO2n and inside of that GLN, which is still not symmetric, but spherical inside of G. So all these are kind of basic examples, there are many more. Now you can ask why specifically to focus on these spaces. Okay, there are many reasons and everybody has his own reasons. You can consider them as generalization of symmetric spaces. Uh, you can study homogeneous spaces and introduce a certain invariant called the complexity of the space. And this would be the simplest one, complexity zero. Um, you can look from the point of view of harmonic analysis on uh, um, <clears throat> um, and invariant linear functionals and these represent representations of uh, a, a group G, which have, if you're looking for H invariant functionals, 
This is very similar to look to embedding into uh, functions on the space G mod H by Frobenius reciprocity. And uh, for those, uh, for these symmetric spaces, you will have finite multiplicities. Um, other motivation comes from uh, integrating automorphic forms on certain cycles, and this leads to, this is called periods of automorphic forms. This leads sometimes to L functions, all kinds of things interesting in number theory. And the local aspect of these are encoded in these linear functionals. And this, of course, was extensively studied by Sakelaridis and Venkatesh. Um, and a nice thing, which I, I wouldn't call a, a reason, but somehow a, a, it's, it's a reason, um, I would say, more uh, um, it comes as an <clears throat> excuse. You have a nice geometric theory that allows you to, to deal with these spaces. You have things which are very similar to Cartan decomposition and uh, all kinds of compactifications, which allows you to study these spaces in a, uh, in a nice way. So I'm not going to elaborate about that too much, but some of this will occur, definitely occur either directly or indirectly in what I'm describing. Um, so from now on, I'm going to, uh, without further ado, assume that uh, my, my uh, uh, space Z is uh, indeed a real, spherical space. Um, okay, so um, let me let me continue. Um, basically, when we look at L2 of Z, as I said, some of the pieces will contribute in, in a discrete manner, some in continuous. Um, so what um, I want to say a little bit about this discrete contribution, because uh, in, in a way, when I'm going to talk about the most continuous part, it lands in the other direction. So uh, one can think about it as the antipode of, of the discrete contribution. So basically, um, one would like to have uh, uh, some representation that actually occurs direct summons of this L2 of Z. So usually uh, one looks at a representation and say that it is uh, Z discrete. Yes, it's not, not a discrete series as a representation of G, rather Z discrete, if uh, it has uh, a non-trivial uh, map to L2 of Z. Of course, um, um, okay, so basically these are representations that are expected to, to occur in a discrete manner in, in L2 of Z. Um, now there is an somehow obvious obstruction to the existence of things like that. Uh, and this is an additional symmetry. I mean, the group H has a normalizer and, some, and the normalizer of H mod H in the case of uh, spherical subgroups has a nice structure. It is a compact group times uh, a vector group. Now, this, this group of course acts from the right on our representation. So we, in some sense, can additionally decompose further. And if we look at uh, this L2 of Z as, as kind of an induction from G to H, then we can do some kind of an induction in stages and decompose according to the Pontryagin dual of, of the vector group V, L2 of Z as um, induced representations from an extension of, of, of uh, uh, <clears throat> the group H by V to G. So what we basically look at are sections uh, of uh, line bundle def defined by lambda on Z. So functions which are additionally satisfy a, an additional property from the right, uh, moving by the character lambda respect to the V. And this is a, a decomposition which we always have. And, and a fact of life is, is that if you do have a discrete series representation for your original space, then this vector group has to be trivial. Well, not so difficult to see. So since we don't want to find ourselves in many cases without anything, I mean, just, we need to adapt a little bit the notion of discrete series and, and the concept, the relevant concept is called twisted discrete series. And you would say that something is twisted discrete series if for some character lambda uh, unitary, um, character of this vector group, pi occurs as um, 
in, in this function space. Okay, so, so this is a small, small change. And now I can say a slogan which is even correct. And the slogan is that the Plancherel decomposition of Z is built up from twisted discrete series representations for Z and its boundary degenerations. I should have given a whole slide to this thing. This is probably very important. So um, in order to, uh, to describe what lies behind this uh, slogan, I, I want to say something about the boundary degenerations. I want to mention that definitely one of them is Z itself. So the part in the Plancherel decomposition, which is kind of discrete, will be attached to, the, to Z itself. So these are the twisted discrete series of Z. Uh, the part that we will be mostly interested will be related to uh, a some other degeneration called the horospherical degeneration of Z. So let me give more, more details about these concepts. Okay, so the first, um, the first uh, thing I want to say is that uh, I move, I, I will not, to be honest, I will not give a formal definition of the, the generation, I just want to be honest. I will give some indication what they are. So I will move to a Lie algebra version. So let's, uh, infinitesimal version, let G be the Lie algebra, A be the Lie algebra of H, and let's fix its dimension. And Let's look in the subspaces of G of dimension N. So of course, obviously, uh, little h is sitting in this Grassmannian. And what we are going to do now is to allow the group G act on this Grassmannian by conjugation. So we, we, when we do this, we get all kind of squeezing around of our subalgebra H. And when we take the closure of these, uh, of these uh, squeezing around, we get all kind of real spherically subalgebras. That's, that's not, that's kind of not difficult. But the fact is that you can decompose it into a, a union of finitely many orbits of uh, spherical least of algebras, H1 up to HR. So this closure is decomposed in this way. Um, and this picture has a parallel on the level of G mod H, namely, uh, one can introduce a certain compactification of Z and construct out of it uh, real spherical spaces. And the Lie algebras of these, of these groups are going to be these algebras that I mentioned above. So basically the degenerations, you, you see how you get them at least to some degree of precision when you, when you go to limits on conjugates of your original uh, um, Lie algebra or subalgebra attached to the subgroup H. Okay, so these are the degenera degenerations. Now I remind, I, the slogan was that the Plancherel decomposition is built up from the twisted discrete series uh, for Z and its boundary degenerations, and these boundary degenerations are now introduced. Okay. So, Dima, am I going too quick or what's going on here? Uh, th that's the first time I understood what is boundary degeneration. Um, I am very thankful to you. Okay. <laughs> At least for me personally, it's perfect. But let us ask if anyone else has questions. So any questions, please? Hi, Adam. Yes. Hi, this is Diwa. Ah, hi, Diwa. Uh, hi. Uh, could you move back one page? Hi. Uh, one more, one more. Uh, yeah, here. So <clears throat> in this decomposition, you induce from H, V, G, lambda. Yes. So lambda is this is vector, right? It's a representation of v. Lambda is a functional on V. It's a unitary v. character of V. And so how do you extend to, to H? You should go to like a stabilizer. Or something. On, the, on the other side. You, you just look at functions on G, which move on the other side. If you act by, by this little V from, from, oh, the, from? from the right, not from the left. Yeah, they, oh. they, they, the action commutes because they are coming from two sides. Oh, two different sides. Yeah, okay. because G mod H has an action on one side from G, but on oh, the okay, other side. Okay, V, v X on the other side. Exactly. It's for free. Okay. Does that make sense? 
well, H normalized V, right? Think about SL2. You, you think H is H think about, with V? Think about SL2 divided by unipotent group. Then yeah. the unipotent group has a torus symmetry because, yeah. yes, from the other side. What I mean by other side, H, you know, or G. Do you, do you have a better example to illustrate? Uh, so I, I think the question is how to how, how this lambda is actually extended to, to H V. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the answer is you you just make it trivial on H and it's the character on V. Yes. Yes. You can make H trivial. Yes. Because that's normalized. Yeah. Well, normalize you don't fix stabilize lambda, right? Let's let, let, let's let's think about this like a parabolic type, and then your v is a uniform radical. You take a, a function here, and then well, if you think about it, the model as the functions on G, which satisfy some properties, then no, it's, it's not, hmm? yeah, it's it's the other way around. So so the the H is a unipotent radical. V is A times N or so, right? The torus times N. So the V, the V, H V is, is, the, is the parabolic and, and V is, is actually the oh, torus. You think, okay, you think H is a unipotent radical? Yes, yes. Yes. The, the, this is the way you think about it? Yes. But this, your V is a vector space. But I think uh, from yeah. the formula you wrote uh, above, mm -hmm. normalizer of H modulo H is C times V. So you have just a projection on to V from, yeah. from HV to V. Okay. Oh. Okay. Diwa, are you happy? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, excuse me, I'm Sengupta. Can I ask a question? You can try me. Yeah, so you're that uh, uh, pi is discrete. So, I mean, in the special case when your spherical space was the group itself. There is the famous criterion of Harish Chandra. No, no, no. I, I did not say, I did not mention any criteria. Just now I'm saying, is there such a criterion in this case? Uh, expected, but not oh, known. Oh, it's not yet known. Not known. I see. Okay. Okay. Some, some partial results are known. I see. So do they also involve some rank thing or it's not at all related? Mm. Basically, a rank condition is expected. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So um, now we come to to the passage from from the geometry to um, to the actual. I mean, okay. Coming back to the slogan, uh, and this is the result uh, of uh, a recent paper by uh, these people: the Long, Frederick Knopf. Uh, Bernard Kreutz and Henrik Schlichtwohl, where they uh, introduced something which they call burnt dimorphism. So this was influenced by the work of the Kalaridis Venkatesh in the PID case. So what they have constructed, and I'm not going to describe this at all, is a map from a direct sum of a certain subspaces of the L2 of each of those degenerations to L2 of Z, and they prove that this map is, uh, um, is nice in the sense that it's G equivalent is a spectral and it's onto. And the point is that this L2ZJ, I mean, this, uh, the, the, the spaces attached to the degenerations uh, are completely, I mean, the only thing which I need to know about, we need to know about them is the twisted discrete series. So namely, we need to know the discrete series in each of those uh, spaces that I have described before. Okay, so here Vj is obviously the uh, using the, the notation we had before. The obvious, the vector group attached to the relevant group here, etc. Okay, so I'm not saying anything about this map B, but this somehow is aligned with the slogan. If you know the discrete series or the twisted discrete series, and you understand well the Bernstein map, then you you have some understanding of L2 of Z. Um, but of course, there are many open problems uh, still uh, <clears throat> out there. For example, the, the one mentioned uh, 
just now about the, about the rank condition, about describing conditions under which we have discrete series. But let me first mention, uh, so, so not just discrete series, but also twisted discrete series. So we need to, to have some conditions for existence and to de determine those things. And furthermore, we want, given those discrete series, to, to determine the multiplicity spaces that were mentioned in the abstract control decomposition, whether, whether a given twisted discrete series occurs in our uh, decomposition. So basically, that, that, that's the state um, that we are uh, on, on this part, on the decomposition of, of Z according to the, the generations. Now, let me pause for a second and say something about the twisted discrete series. I'm not going to say much about it, uh, just a few remarks. So, um, first of all, there is a, a theorem, which is basically, it's also uh, playing an important role in that recent work about Bernstein morphisms, this theorem by uh, Kreutzkoit, Optum, and Schlittwohl. And uh, this is about restrictions about the infinitesimal characters of discrete series or twisted discrete series. And the restrictions are, uh, can be thought of as a spectral gap. So this says that the infinitesimal character uh, must have values that are integral. So they kind of sit in a lattice, maybe not exactly integral, but at least sit in a lattice. Um, and this was, um, this, this is important. Um, it is actually known a certain geometric condition which is necessary for the existence of discrete series. I assume, but I'm not sure about the possibility to extend it to twisted discrete series, but uh, it's wide open about finding sufficient conditions for existence of discrete series and uh, for the construction of this. And this is uh, much uh, researched uh, we, uh, by, by, I assume, these people. Okay, so this was some kind of remarks about the twisted discrete series. Let's just get an overview. Um, now I want to get into uh, telling you at least what is the most continuous part that I'm talking about in order to formulate some of the results we, we have. So uh, I told you that in this, the closure of the, um, the action of G on, on this Lie algebra H, the closure is composed of finitely many uh, uh, G orbits. And in it, there is precisely one closed G orbit. And it is this with, which is attached to uh, a subalgebra, which we denote by H empty. And attached to this subalgebra, there is a group H empty. I will say a little bit more about it uh, to the effect that you, you will not want to know. But uh, at the moment, <laughs> it seems very, very, uh, Mysterious, but I will say more about it soon. And nevertheless, the, the most continuous part of the Plancherel uh, part uh, decomposition, or what, what, what we want to achieve, is basically the image under the Bernstein map. So I remind you, this is the Bernstein map. And one of the pieces here is attached to Z empty, the horospherical degeneration, that's the name. Um, and what we want is to take the twisted discrete series attached to it and look at the image under the B map, which I haven't described. And this is a unitary sub-representation and we want to decompose it. I want to make a comment that in the reductive symmetric case, there is a whole paper developed, uh, de devoted to this topic of the most continuous part of the Plantrell theorem for reductive symmetric case. And in that case, the description was not in this language, but it was in the language of uh, principal series representations, and it was described as an integral of an of irreducible uh, representations that are induced from a minimal sigma parabolic subgroup. So this was uh, explicated in a very long paper, a very difficult paper by uh, Eric van der Bunn and Henrik Schlittwohl. So um, let me. Um, Okay, so I, I hope I, I made some sense. I gave a relation between L2 of Z and twisted discrete series on Z and on other spaces. 
On Z itself, these are the twisted discrete series, which are a bit mysterious. And on Z empty, these are the ones that we want to study. So I'm now going to tell you a little bit more about Z empty and uh, about the um, <clears throat> subgroup H empty in particular. So let me, let me do that. Um, so I remind that uh, we had in the very beginning said that our uh, space Z is spherical. So that meant that a minimal parabolic has an open orbit. Okay, so we can align the parabolic in such a way that when we do, we, we think about the geometry happening now on G, G itself, that when we multiply P and H, look at this, it's going to be open in G. Uh, and I want to fix some Langlands decomposition of P. And to be honest, this Langlands decomposition has to be uh, nice with respect to H. I mean, A has to be in a good position with respect to H and I'm not going to elaborate about that. Um, what I'm going to, to describe now is H empty. So, First of all, there is some generality. If you take a, a linear subspace of uh, the Lie algebra G, whose dimension is N, and you take any point in the Lie algebra of A and consider the exponential and, and put some parameter and take the conjugate of this linear space and take a limit, then this limit exists. Fact. Even more significant, and this depends on uh, this, story is that if you do the same process, not for the subspace E, but rather to uh, the Lie algebra of our group H and run the limit in a certain direction, when directions which are in the negative uh, vial chamber attached to uh, our choices, uh, then the limit will be independent of X. And this gives you the Lie algebra H empty. Okay, so... Ethan, so H with subindex X, it should be just H, yes? The subindex is. No, no, I mean, uh, it's just, uh, yeah, there is a misnomer here. For every space E, there is the E subindex X. Uh huh. I so, see. So Thank this you. is the Thank limit. You. Got it. This HX at, uh, is, is the limit which you perform here, but the X is basically you choose anything you want here. Okay, at least Got it. generic Thanks. enough. Okay. Okay. Uh, and this is H empty, which is one of one of the list H1, H2, HR that occurred over there in the limits, okay? But that's a special limit. It's somewhat more unipotent than others, okay? Um, so here is what I said that you probably won't want to hear, will not want to hear. So, um, but this is going to be relevant for me. So, so. Okay, what is the aim? I want to describe a little bit further uh, L2 of Z empty, because I need this in order to describe the most continuous part. So to describe L2 of Z empty, I'm going to change my picture. And instead of looking at things from a uh, perspective of uh, um, P, I'm going to, to introduce another group Q. Okay, so let me explain. Uh, the claim, which is non-trivial, is that there exists a parabolic group with a Langlands decomposition, MQ, AQ, NQ, containing P, with the following properties. First of all, MQ, when you divide it by MQ into section H, is compact. So actually, it's equal to what you had originally with your original P. Second, uh, HQ, H empty, which is, you know, it's Lie algebra I already basically described to you, is equal to the following. It's a product of the part of M of H, which is in MQ, the part of H, which is in A, and an additional big chunk of unipotent piece, which is exactly uh, the part in the um, opposite parabolic of Q. Okay, so these, these are pieces which are remaining after the limit, basically. That, that's what I'm essentially saying it. Now, uh, if you think about this, and, and this is something which is a little bit, uh, requires some concentration, you will see that uh, 
this Q bar uh, is definitely um, containing H empty and H empty contains N Q bar. Now this, this, this alignment is, is important for us. And uh, just, just in order not to, okay. So, so there is this group. So an example, and that may be the reason for the name Horace Ferrical boundary degeneration is the case of a Riemannian symmetric space. In this case, it's a calculation showing that G is going to be, uh, Z empty is G mod M N bar. And this space uh, is space which is uh, well known in uh, the geometry of Horus spheres. So that's, it is just uh, classifying uh, the Horus spheres. So that's basically the reason for the name. Now I want to move again back to the L2. So I, I recall that Q bar contains uh, H empty. And now let's look again at L2 of Z empty. So the first claim, which actually is an afterthought, is that this is equal to L2 Z empty uh, to, uh, twisted discrete series. So everything in L2 Z empty is twisted discrete series. So you can think about it as, as a statement, as a theorem, proposition. Actually, I'm going to give a hint. Okay, is this a hint? It's not clear that this is a hint. Uh, but um, think about uh, L2 of Z empty, uh, maybe think about L2 of Z empty without the uh, twisted discrete series uh, as an induced representation from H empty to G. So you want to go from H empty to G, but why won't you stop in the middle in Q bar and then go from Q bar to G? So that's basically what you do. You, you look at these principal series and you amend also their multiplicities. And then you have the piece attached with uh, the group A mod A intersection H and the compact group uh, that you, so that, that's what you saw here, this M mod M intersection H is compact. So these two, uh, M is compact. So only representations of M which are trivial on M intersection H would be relevant. So that's, that's what you, uh, you, will, you will get. So basically this uh, equality is obtained from, um, I would say induction in stages and a little bit. Uh, and after you have this equality between the, the right-hand side and the left-hand, sorry, <laughs> the left-hand side and the right-hand side, you can deduce the equality that I wrote here and you can deduce that the twisted discrete series for Z empty are exactly these principal series. So here, this is a case where uh, you can actually analyze the twisted discrete series. Um, okay. Now, the most continuous part now is, is basically by, by the definition. This is the definition, yes? Uh, and by the properties, the isospectrality and the G equivalence of B, it has to basically commute with this decomposition. And um, now I'm using um, basically the understanding of what this operator B does it basically moves multiplicity spaces on Z empty to multiplicity spaces on Z. So just secretly, the map B is constructed um, locally in the sense that it's, it's constructed representation, representation. Now you have an abstract decomposition for each of the spaces and you do it representation, representation. But uh, for this, you basically have to have something which is called a constant term map, which goes the other direction. So you have a constant term going from functions, certain functions on Z to functions on Z empty or some other degeneration. And then on the linear functional is it going the other way around. So this of course is a total hoax. I mean, you, you have to invest a lot of effort in order to understand actually how this map is defined. But if you just believe that there is such a map which is satisfying all the natural requirements, it must send this integral to this integral. And again, this M empty is just the thing, the multiplicities on, on Z empty. And these are the multiplicities on Z. 
Now, is it quick to say what is uh, isospectral or? Presume it's uh, <laughs> easy to say. I don't know if it will give anything. <laughs> okay. Okay. So well, basically, it, it just it just means that that you have you have the same representations on both sides. Basically, so. basically the map the map does not uh, erase representations. That's okay. To formulate. Mm -hmm matter how formalist you are. Okay, so now what are we doing? Uh, as I said, we want to decompose this L2 of uh, most continuous part. So if you look at this, after you do all this massaging and using what uh, uh, was known, uh, you basically are, are left with understanding these multiplicity spaces. So basically what we are doing, we are um, um, making these spaces explicit we are um, able to describe the scalar product, the Hilbert st uh, structure on these spaces. Unfortunately, I don't think I will be able to describe this scalar product in a proper way here because just I realized that it's just too complicated in terms of formulas to do it. And, uh, but uh, I, will do, I will do some justice by saying some properties of these spaces that we, uh, we prove and can be easily formulated. Okay, so uh, we get explicit description of these spaces with the Hilbert structure. And so let, let me try to, to explain that. So for a, a unitary representation, I want to remind, okay, there, there is some notation hazard here, uh, that basically if you have a unitary representation and you want to check if it's occur of G, if it's occurring L2 of Z, you, you have to have some linear functional, which is H invariant on your representation. So what does it mean? The representation pi has a Hilbert space H pi. In that space, you have smooth vectors, but your functional is really a continuous functional on these smooth vectors and it is H invariant, okay? Now the multiplicity spaces naturally are sitting in this space, but they are not necessarily equal. It could be that you have linear functionals, but this kind of embedding of your representation into function spaces on Z will not end up in L2. The, the, the functional will create a, a, a generalized matrix coefficient, which is just growing too fast, okay? So um, we want to describe these spaces. And again, not for all representations, but only for those representations that are already suspect as occurring in the decomposition. And we already have the suspects. This induced representation from the parabolic Q which we brought from home. I remind, we started with a parabolic P and we already brought a parabolic Q. Actually, we are working with the opposite parabolic, okay? So basically we have a print, uh, some kind of a principal series representation and we want to study uh, these spaces. First of all, the space of H invariant functionals and second, the subspace, which will contribute to the Plancherel theory. And these are potentially their different spaces. So what we do is we give explicit construction of all H fixed functionals in this. Okay, I don't have to write the H here if I say H fixed functionals, I apologize for this blunder. So we just have to give explicit construction of this vector space, but for generic parameter. And this is sufficient because we have uh, there an, an integral, it's a Plancherel theory. Uh, and then we have a somewhat surprising result uh, that if, Lambda is generic that any continuous H fixed functional on this space is automatically Z tempered. So namely, what we are saying is that this multiplicity space is attached now not to the representation pi, a, a random pi, but rather to a principal series attached to a generic parameter in this quotient space is just identical to the space of all H invariant functions. Okay, so this is absolutely crucial that, that the statement I'm saying will be clear. So I, I'm ready for questions and uh, um, about, about, just about the statement. Okay, so it seems that everybody is, it's either obvious or everybody is lost. Dima, what do you say? 
Everybody's lost? Well, I don't know. I'm not lost. I... Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, it seems okay. that Yel has a question. Okay. No. Uh, I'm also not lost, although I just uh, joined. But... Ah, you are not lost. Okay, so it's all, all trivial. That's good. You know, once a, once a year to hear a trivial lecture, it's not so bad. Okay, so, um, so basically what I'm saying here is that whatever you can construct on the unitary line is going to be Z-tempered. For these twisted discrete series, which are attached to the most degenerate, to, 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 to the horospherical degeneration, okay? Okay. So uh, here, how much time do I have more? 10 minutes or what? Uh, at five. least 15. Why 15? We started at five and I have 547. Okay. <laughs> you give me 15, that's, that's a lot. Okay. Um, don't let your people suffer. Okay, so um, I can divide this, uh, the, the, the task of, of the proof in, into two pieces. Uh, the first piece is to actually uh, construct uh, the functionals. And second, to, to show that these functionals are Z-tempered. I will not say much about the proof of temperedness. It's, uh, I, I will make a comment though. Um, so, so what can I say about the constructions? <clears throat> so how would we attack such a problem? I mean, we would just do some orbit analysis. We have the H orbits on G mod Q bar. We have, we have some orbits and we want to, to construct some linear functionals. So that's, that's what you, you, you basically would do. And that's what people did in the symmetric case. Um, so basically uh, an H fixed functional should look like something like I have a function on my space. I move it by H. I, I, take, I take a base point. I think about everything living on G. So instead of uh, thinking about, yeah, so everything is living on G. So this, I can think about an element here as uh, basically a distribution on G, which is H and Q bar equivariant. And I just need to, to construct it. So I want to integrate over H um, and I have some choice for, for the point X in G and some functional from the representation Xi, which I want to pair with. So I do some integration, but of course there is some extra invariant. So I divide by the intersection of H and the stabilizer. Stabilizer depends on the point. So that's basically what you want to do. But life is not as good as you would want it to be. Uh, so some of the cosets of the groups H and Q bar inside of G are open. So for those, you get that these integrals usually will diverge. Okay, so you know what to do. You add some parameter lambda, which is now, you care about principal series which are living on the unitary line. The lambda should be unitary. But what you do, you will complexify, you will add some parameter, and this will introduce a shift in the um, modulus character, which will allow you to let the integral converge. So you will get convergence in certain cone. And this of course is far from where you are, but then you use some kind of a meromorphic continuation trick, some kind of a P to the Lambda lemma of Bernstein and Sato. And then you, you will get some meromorphic continuation and you will be able to construct your functional. Okay, that's some standard thing. And you may have poles, right? Yeah, you may have poles, but since you are working on, 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 on some line, you, 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 okay, in bernstein sato you have a control on where the poles might be. You know, you have some hyperplanes and you can, you can avoid the poles. That's the point, okay? And since you, are, you have an, an integral on, uh, on affine spaces of lambdas, on real affine spaces of lambdas, you are imaginary, you, you don't care about measure zero. Um, avoid, you can avoid them, okay? Um, is that clear? Is that okay? You may, you may have poles. Yes, I, I don't see a reason why you want. You want.
Okay. Um, unlike the symmetric case, in this case, uh, it turns out that non-open double cosets also contribute, even for it's not for special values of lambda, but for for the most of lambdas. You will have situations where you can construct a consistent family uh, living or coming from a non-open double cosset. And this requires, uh, uh, I mean, in the construction, uh, further uh, understanding of uh, how to move from uh, an open double cosset, from a non-open double cosset to an open double cosset, uh, and this we do using uh, intertwining operators. And uh, so this, this is actually quite very careful analysis of, uh, of the orbits. And then one constructs the functional on uh, an open orbit and move it using the intertwining operator to the non-open orbit. Um, there are other issues um, some of these uh, quotients do not have measures, but then you use different models for the functionals and, and you, you fix this uh, inconsistency of modular functions. Okay, so, so this is uh, uh, the part of the construction which I'm not elaborating about. And further, there is another, another next step to show that when the parameter is imaginary, then these functionals are tempered. And I'm not entering into this uh, thing because this is, uh, I would say, one of the most technical parts uh, of the work because we need somehow to use the technology developed in the papers on the constant term uh, by uh, uh, Delorme, Kroetz, and, and Sophie, and uh, Belasis. Uh, so so, so th there, are, there are some uh, rather uh, complicated technology, but this technology unfortunately is not applicable in our case because the input to that technology of constant term is that your original function should be tempered. So we need somehow to follow the technique without the assumptions. And that's uh, quite non-trivial. Okay, um, the second part is, is this exhaustion that uh, we, we want to show that, okay, we have constructed some things. How do we know that we constructed everything? The fact that we, we saw that we can find some orbits and write some integrals and move them to some uh, open orbits and things have some Bernstein sato lemma, that's very good. But how do we know that we, we have all the functionals that are there? So for this, we need some further technique. And um, so, this is based on uh, some idea of, um, <clears throat> which was, I think, probably introduced in the paper on the discrete series that I mentioned before by, uh, um, <clears throat> by the four authors, um, Kurtz, Coit, uh, Obdam, and uh, Schlichtwohl. So let me say a little bit about that. I, I will not say a lot, but I just want to give some flavor of what's going on because of course this, this becomes rather technical. So again, we, we already have some construction. We want to show that we exhausted everything. So we start from some H invariant functional on our principal series, which is now coming from our parabolic Q bar. We know that we can embed it uh, into uh, a related principal series on P. And thus we can think about these objects as distributions on G, which are H comma P equivariant. Now, the problem is that it's not so easy. I mean, you want to use Broa theory. So basically we're living on P orbits on Z because it's H equivariant. So it's G mod H and then there is a P equivariant. So basically it's P orbits on Z, but we don't have a good uh, numbering, good understanding of these P orbits. Um, what will come out of this analysis is that only certain orbits, I'm not going to define them, but uh, they are called maximal rank orbits. Only these orbits are potentially contributing. So this is some kind of an, uh, um, 
not for every lambda, but for generic lambda. Um, and, and this is based on the following uh, idea or lemma. Suppose I have a distribution which is uh, now living on this principal series from P and is H invariant. So I can think about it as a linear functional or as a distribution. Then there is a certain process of limiting that can be done by um, <clears throat> essentially squeezing with a one parameter subgroup. So since we think about everything on G, we, we basically do a shift. So it's not really, uh, so we, we, we shift the point, the base point X by the exponent of TX. We let T goes to infinity. X has to, has to be here in the negative vial chamber. So this may, maybe does not have a limit, but if you tame it with some exponent of T with some parameter R, then this will have a limit at least as, a distribution on some open neighborhood of G. And that's, that's kind of uh, highly non-trivial. I mean, the fact that this limit is non-zero, it gives out of the blue, and it's in some sense not, um, not clear at all where it comes from. For every point X and for every uh, direction in this vial chamber, for every point in this negative vial chamber, out of your distribution, you, you get something for free, which is non-zero. Basically, uh, what you do is you write your distribution in, uh, um, in, in this neighborhood and write it in, in some direction and write the transverse of derivative in the other direction and you start squeezing. And what you take is the major part, the leading parts of the derivatives that occur. So the catch is that if mu had a transversal derivative at this point, is of course a concept you need to define. <laughs> then uh, the limiting distribution also has transversal derivative. And furthermore, this limit distribution is invariant with respect to subalgebras very similar to the ones we talked about, namely uh, pushing H with a family of elements from the group to infinity. So some kind of a limiting subalgebra. Uh, and Using this further information, we get uh, strong restrictions on the support of the distributions. Of course, it's not always that you get a, a constraint on the support. It depends on the parameters, namely the finite dimensional representation xi and the parameter lambda. This is the most relevant piece of the puzzle. And for generic lambda, it follows that the distribution must be supported on so-called maximal rank orbits. I just want to comment that in many cases, these are just the open orbits for in symmetric cases and in some other cases, but not always. So you still have to, to deal with those. And um, basically there are two kinds of things you want to show, what orbits you, you can live on, and second, that there are no transversal derivatives. And to show now that there are no transversal derivatives, you, you just move to show that not from you, but for your limit, mu x, x, which is invariant with respect to some kind of algebra which is more unipotent. So eventually, you are reduced to showing that there are no transversal derivatives to spaces like g mod n bar. And this you can just do by hand. You know what are the distributions generically which are invariant on these kind of subspaces. So this is a technique, a technology which is rather different than the Buha theory, and uh, I think it might ha have many more applications. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention and, uh, attention, and happy birthday to Dima. I, I, I finished. I, now, any question you have, you, you should, of course, direct directly to Dima, because or AL because they completely understood everything and I I just will ask them after the lecture. Thank you, Aitan. So let us let us first have some questions to the speaker. Okay.
I, I have a lot of questions. Um, first of all, uh, is Q the adapted parabolic? Yes. Good. A second, you say complexity zero. So is there a notion of complexity that detects real spherical pairs? It's a good question. I, first of all, I used it just as, a, as an excuse. You know, you want to understand why spherical. So you just say, these are the simplest one. I think that, okay, I vaguely remember looking at, uh, at this concept of complexity also adapted uh, in some paper for real case, but I don't want to say too much. Okay, it's not, it's, it's not my department. Okay. I see, I see. And now, uh, can you explain what Bergson morphisms are? <laughs> no way. Uh, okay, I, I can just say some words which will give some, I hope, some understanding, but okay. First of all, there are better people than me in the audience to explain, maybe, maybe. Um, okay, I will say something uh, and, and Job will fix, will probably correct me. So there is this concept of going to, um, to given a, a linear functional on, for representation on, on pi, you have, uh, you have this function on z. You can just construct a function, evaluate your functional on the orbit map of a vector. Yes. So this is a function on z. And my understanding is that um, in the generality of, uh, of functions, you can attach to what's called tempered functions some kind of a constant term approximation for any degeneration. So for any of the zi, you have some fi, so that basically f minus fi, whatever that means, because they live on different places, is kind of smallish. Okay, you have to give a lot of mm -hmm. formalism in order to explain what it is. And of course, there is an, an action from the right, from this group ai, which you want to be compatible with. So. Uh, so this is some kind of a constant term for functions. But then you, but by dualizing, you can do the same thing for, for distributions or for, for at least for linear functionals. And then for a functional eta, you have these pieces, eta i. And you would study the linear functionals in terms of these pieces, eta i. Uh, this gives you the possibility to go from multiplicity spaces on z to multiplicity spaces on z i. You see, ZI is also a G space. It's not that you move to a different group, yes? So this allows you to make some comparison between multiplicity spaces, even if you don't know them. So this map is very abstract. This is not really constructed, con uh, you know, simply. Uh, but then now if you have them for every pi, you just integrate and you get a map on, on, the, on, the, on the L2 or whatever. That's what I meant that you construct them locally, representation by representation somehow. This is the first time I understood this. Okay, I'm not sure it's correct. It may be that I cheated a lot and, and, and maybe it's good that... Uh... Uh, it's, if it's called Bersen morphisms, you are allowed to cheat a little bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, yes, please. Uh, okay, I, I, I would like to ask, maybe it's trivial if, if you are familiar with the Benchen Sato extension, but uh, the, the morphic continuation, does it come together with continuity? Because, or, or is it clear in this context that this continuation is continuous? To me, nothing is clear. Maybe by the definition. To me, nothing is clear. But in fact, when Bernstein constructed the thing, he constructed the thing, whatever he's constructing, in a Schwarz space. So for Bernstein, uh, it's more or less automatic because he constructs a map from D modules, whatever. We didn't really use this uh, in that language. So we, you know, <laughs> we did it rightfully. I think, I think in, some, in some situation, you can actually deduce the continuity of some strange thing you constructed from this abstract existence. In our particular case, as far as I remember, I did not understand how to do it. 
What continuity of what exactly? I mean, so I mean you have, what I think he's saying, you construct some linear functionals for lambda big, you know it's a continuous functional, but now you start moving. How uh, would you know that the thing that's yes. been constructed is constructed is, is, is really a smooth functional? It's yeah, a, because so the shift in the parameter so, is, is caused by applying a differential operator. And so then, you, and then, you have a distribution and then you go with differential operators, you go down. So this, this stays continuous. Yes. Okay, thanks. Correct. Any further questions? Yeah, I'd like to ask a simple question. So these discrete uh, TDS, do you expect them to be typically non-tempered? Okay, first of all, I want to say there is an expert in the audience for TDS. Yop is an expert. So I, I prefer that he <laughs> will give his impression about the TDS. I mean, he wrote a, a basic paper on the topic. Uh, I, I don't have any uh, understanding apart from the paper, which recently was uploaded to the archive, describing a, a representation with one embedding, if I understand correctly, into the discrete series and another embedding in something which is not even tempered. Is that correct? Yes. So, so, so really temperedness is a, is a notion that you have to... Right. So it's not, it's not that the representation is tempered. It's more like a, a pair of representation and a functional is tempered. So okay. by, by okay. definition, twisted discrete series, so representations and the functionals corresponding to, to give the embedding, they're, they're by definition tempered because otherwise they can't contribute in this, in this, in this uh, uh, um, L2 of, the, of, of, the, of, these, of these boundary degenerations in the first place. So, so that, that's not, a, not so much the question, but the question is rather... Could it be that you have a representation which has a tempered functional and a non-tempered functional? And there are examples of that, yeah. So it's just that for this most continuous part, this for some reason doesn't occur. So it, this is a bit a miracle. So I, I don't really see a very good reason why this a priori shouldn't be. Um, it just doesn't happen. Uh, but if you go to the discrete series, so more, more, more on the discrete side of things, or the other, the other side of the spectrum, then this, this definitely does happen. So we, we gave a an example of a symmetric space where you have this, this phenomenon occurring. So temperedness is not the right question here. That's what you're saying, right? So, well, it depends on, yeah, okay. So temperedness is the correct question. It's just, so temperedness is a property of, of a pair, right? So you can't say a distribute or a representation is tempered. It's always a representation together with a functional. My understanding is that this is the only interesting question if you want to understand planetarial theory. In order to understand planetarial theory, you only care about the Z-tempered things that you can construct. But if you are interested in linear functionals like me, then you might be interested also in things which are not tempered. That, that's, you know, you're allowed. In this case, you get, you get, I mean, you get the, the identical. But we don't have an a priori proof of this. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, I should say that after you have this description and, and the construction, so what is the benefit? Why, how can you, in principle, can have a scalar product? Because you do have a formula. You, you know what are these this linear functionals. And so you can start playing around with them and, and try to understand how they will occur in the planetarial the, the, uh, in the embedding that I described before. And uh, out of it, you can actually construct explicitly a scalar product. It's not easy to describe, so it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's I would full, fill another two or three pages just for formulas. Um, at the moment, at least, I don't have a, a better understanding than that of how this scalar product goes. Okay? Thank you. Sure. I have one technical question. Uh, what is the difficulty with uh, non-open orbits? I, I mean, I would say that they are closed subsets of open subsets. So you can extend by zero to the open subset, and then the situation is similar to having an open orbit. Is the problem that the open subset is not, is not invariant? Open subset is not invariant. Okay, I'm not sure I understood your, your idea, but... Uh... <clears throat> We could not manipulate it in, in the way we did with Sai. I see. So I'm not saying it's impossible. We couldn't do it. And uh, I, think, I think it cannot be done, but I, I, I'm not sure about it. Okay? I cannot. 
Yeah, so that's, that's a real problem with the mirror morph continuation, right? So the, these integrals also do not converge on the uh, imaginary axis. And then, then it's not clear where at all. So for which lambda at all, they would be convergent. So I ah. think in your paper, there was, you, 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 I mean, so you look at the cases where you, where you have a, um, where these orbits are described by the zero set of a, para, of a, of a function. Function. Of a function, right? So you, so you just, you just multiply it to death. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And then, then you can do something, but it's not so clear that you can do that in this case. I see, I see. It's kind of a composition of two kind of different analytic continuations, which we don't really, I don't know how to. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right. Okay, I hope. Uh... Yeah, so if there are any more questions, uh, we just welcome. If, if not, we have... <laughs> okay. okay, I I, I know I promised more in, in the abstract. I, I want to apologize for those who came who did not get the scattering operators. But if you invite, invite me for the next semester, I hope by then I will be able to describe something. But at the moment, it, it, was, it just became impossible for me to to prepare this so i apologize no it's it's okay you did talk for an hour and then answered a, a lot of questions thank you so much and uh, we will be glad to invite you again in the next semester so uh, i'm saying again that we hope to have a talk in two weeks but uh, i cannot say who is the speaker yet <laughs> and it's not final yet <laughs> so Hope to see you in two weeks, and uh, if not, then Merry Christmas, uh, Happy belated Hanukkah, and okay. <laughs> the other winter holiday. Thanks, Dima. Thanks, Dima, for your invitation. It was very My kind pleasure. of you. My pleasure. And you, you brought a new audience, and you returned some of our canonical audience back. <laughs> canonical. So <laughs> this okay. was very successful. Okay. Okay. I'm happy. Okay, so I hope to see you in a couple of weeks. And now, I, and now I'm on YouTube. Yes, now you are a YouTube star. <laughs> now you will be famous. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>